Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're looking at Pirate Borg, which is a supplement or a setting for the Merkberg role playing game, which I have looked at in the past. This is a sponsored Kickstarter preview. So, this is currently on Kickstarter right now. And this PDF is a pretty good representation of the final product. It's not completely finished. There's some more editing that needs to be done and some more content needs to be fleshed out. But hopefully, by going through this whole um, preview PDF, you should get a very clear sense of what's in this book and whether it is right for you. Now it is sponsored, but of course I will be giving my honest feedback on the things I like about it, the things that I would change and so forth. So without further ado, let's dig into Pirate Borg. We have our inside front cover here, which is a reference table, uh, melee weapons, uh, ranged weapons, looting the body, all the stuff that you're probably going to need if you're a pirate. And we have our title page. It was all written and illustrated by Luke Stratton uh, with public domain images also. So it's a kind of a mix of those two things. Some of the inspirations for this include things like the Black Hack, the Dark of Hot Springs Island. I believe Jacob Hurst is actually going to be working on Pirate Borg as possibly a stretch goal or as an, an extra little thing. Uh, Neverland, which is another great role playing game. Mothership on Stranger Tides. The Secret of Monkey Island. That's how you know this guy is a man of taste and discernment is that he loves the Monkey Island games. Um, our very first opening pages here, early explorers thought the dark Caribbean was paradise. They found nothing but deserted trophies and bountiful treasures. Deserted trophies? The font is a little bit hard to read. It wasn't until thousands had left their crowded blighted homelands and settled in among the islands that they encountered the scourge. It began on the solstice. Haunting screams echoed over sandy beaches, and from the uh, death-black waves crawled the undead. Terror spread like wildfire. So I think a little bit like Merkberg, it is um, kind of grimdark, a bit over the top, a bit heavy metal. But having skimmed through this previously, it definitely has a, a little bit of a lighter tone, and it's less about the impending end of the world, although you can definitely do that if you want as it is about making a very D&D-like pirate Caribbean setting. And I think it has a lot of great tools for doing that, whether you are using the Merkberg system or whether you are using some other system like OSR or Old School Essentials or things like that. Uh, a general history of the Dark Caribbean. So chronicling the adventures and happenings in the islands of the New World and their utter descent into apocalypse. So we have... Um, sort of four different main, th or sorry, six main threads here. The Great Antilles War, the rise and fall of Nassau, the scourge of the New World, the ashes of Tortuga, uh, the wretched exalted, and eldritch tides of doom. And each of these has different chapters as they progress forward. So you can use this timeline in order to make this, you know, ticking clock as the world reaches its end, or you can steal little pieces of it and spice up your environment with them. We get into playing a character. Now, the layout and the design of this definitely reminds me a lot of Merkberg. I have to stop myself from saying Morkborg. People tell me that it's Merkberg. I'm sure I'm messing it up one way or another. Um, but I think it does, in some ways, a better job than that book because although it has a lot of variety from page to page in terms of the design, in general, I think it's easier on the eyes and a little bit better laid out and a little bit less confusing. Uh, create a player character. Uh, you have your basic steps here. A lot of it is just randomized. Your ability scores. See, like this, for example, this reminds me a little bit more of um, the work in Into the Odd Remastered, where it's just a lot clearer and easier to read, um, despite having a lot of variety and creativity in terms of the way that it is laid out. Now, the fonts in general are also much easier to read. A lot of fell fonts, a lot of black letter fonts, and things like that, rather than the hundreds of different fonts that the original book used. You're rolling your ability scores. So it's a negative three to a plus three. You have five different abilities. You're rolling against a target number, stuff that's not too surprising. You do have a slot-based encumbrance, which I always like. And we start getting into our classes here. So we have the brute. Uh, when you're not smashing, um, slashing, crashing, well, that's all you really know how to do. You can't use relics or arcane rituals, but your muscles are basically magic. So you have some, a starting feature you can choose here and you can upgrade them with more stuff as you get more powerful, like a blood frenzy or becoming thick skinned. You're a tough melee combat uh, combatant prone to fits of rage, a bit like a berserker or a barbarian. Uh, Rapscallion, 
a sneaky cutthroat scallywag, good at backstabbing, breaking and entering, stealing, cheating, and escaping. Found in taverns, shadows, and shallow graves, so a little bit like a thief. I like how all of the different abilities are put on playing cards here. I think that's a good use of the layout. Uh, some people complain about the layout in these uh, Merkborg, Merkberg uh, derived games, but one of the advantages of having unique layouts for each two page spread is that it tends to make them easier to find later on. And that's because they have such a unique aesthetic to them that you can just picture in your head what that page looked like because it's easy to remember. You flip through the book and boom, you can find it purely visually. Uh, you got a buccaneer, expert sharpshooter, a swashbuckler, a brash fighter with bravado and swagger. Some things you might get include the Shakespeare of insults or the sword master, right? You're a, you're a real swashbuckler. The zealot. There is a vertical table on the side there, a little bit hard to read, but you can just turn the book sideways. Uh, a clergy member, cultist, shaman, or believer. So this is your cleric-ish character. Uh, thee may use relic and arcane rituals while wearing medium armor. When thou doth begin, and every time thou thy doth improve. Should it be thou? I don't know my old English very well. Learn a single random prayer. Each prayer that thy doth know may be used once a day, etc., Kind of some flavor there that it's using old fashioned language just for the zealot. You got a sorcerer uh, if you want to get some magic powers. And we start getting into our rules. Again, not too complicated. Uh, the base system is quite straightforward. How you go about doing violence and getting better. We have a general list of weapons here. Um, it's all pirate themed stuff, knives or bayonets, finely crafted rapiers, boarding axes. And we start getting into our equipment, which is quite um, detailed. Lots of different uh, gear that you can get. Musical instruments, speaking trumpets, spy glasses, tankards, all pirate-themed stuff. I've also been playing a decent amount of uh, Sea of Thieves recently, so this hits that for me. Uh, melee weapons. We have this page for the Devil's Luck. So this is a point-based system. Every class gains a number of Devil's Luck points. Landlubbers begin with D2. And when depleted, roll your class's designated die to regain that much luck after resting for at least six hours. So you can spend these points to do stuff like dealing max damage with an attack or neutralizing a crit or a fumble. Uh, we also have a background table over here, D100 backgrounds for starting characters, though it looks like the first 20 are all sailor, which is appropriate. You could get stuff like skill at shooting or a medical kit or a compass or good manners, a little bit of flavor and possibly a useful item to start off your beginning character. Um, distinctive flaws, physical ailments to make your pirate even more unique, idiosyncrasies, unfortunate incidents and conditions, having occurred or developed with or without one's express consent, desire, knowledge, or general understanding. I, I really like the way that the uh, layout and the typography feels like an old newspaper or the uh, front page of an old book. Things could be like, uh, you're a known pirate, you face the gallows of caught, you slaughtered them all like animals. Good Star Wars reference there. Uh, things of importance that you can pick up. There's a lot of really great random tables in here, which is why I mentioned before that this would make a good book, even if you weren't using the system. Um, if I was running a pirate themed adventure, I would probably use this book. I don't have a lot of piratey material, and this has lots of just solid stuff to throw into your games to make it feel more piratey. Um, a jar containing a severed hand, eyeball or organ, six feet of chain, a petrified egg, a broken compass with mysterious significance, things like that. Ancient relics to turn up the uh, power level a little bit more. Things like uh, a conch self from the abyss. Ask a nearby corpse or any creature that died at sea one question. Arcane rituals. So I suppose this would be for the sorcerer. Um, some spells include things like obfuscate time. D2 creatures recover some spirit, but age uh, do 2d10 months. If you're tracking your age, that would be important. Mists of Confusion, uh, Return from the Locker. A recently killed creature returns to life with uh, one hit point. Their lungs expel black ichor and bilge water. That's great. That's good flavor. Uh, mystical mishaps for casting magic. Things can go badly. Like your vision permanently fills with water and the world around you looks submerged and obfuscated. Presence checks involving sight are plus four DR. I think that's the target number you're trying to hit if I remember correctly. Uh, unfortunately, you see like underwater, you see like fish. So there's a little 
special thing that is added onto each of these that isn't immediately obvious, which is really funny. So then players can find out these little bonus quirks. Uh, some monsters here. There's not too many monsters, but there, more are going to get added on as the Kickstarter goes on and things get fleshed out. I love that it has a three-headed monkey. That is a Monkey Island reference, one of my favorite video games. Uh, lots of different skeletons because, of course, it's a pirate game. You'll fight lots of skeletons. I love how they have different varieties so that you can keep the skeletons going without being too repetitive. Rank and file, dead eyes, a Hulk skeleton, a warlock, etc. And they all have great little illustrations. Zombies. The Grog Barrel, the Admiral. Again, you don't just have bog standard zombies. You have variety to keep things fresh. Uh, deep Ones, a little bit of Lovecraft there. Gorilla Crabs, Sea Wraiths. The Undead Megalodon, the Kraken. Gotta have a Kraken. Rules for Naval Combat. Um, if you're going to be on pirate ships, you're going to have to have rules for that. It recommends using a hex grid. And it has rules for moving around, for firing off broadsides, for figuring out what, what are the fore and the aft and the you know port and starboard are. Different crew actions, so the crews can, the PCs that are on the ship can take actions uh, like full sail, coming about, repairing, ramming other ships, etc. You got rules for sinking your ship, wind rules that are optional, flotsam and jetsam, encounters, events, plenty of things to throw at your players as they are sailing across your dark Mediterranean. Not Mediterranean, Caribbean. Well, you could do the Mediterranean too. Uh, lots of write ups for different types of boats rafts, pinnacles, sloops, brigandines. Don't know how to say that one. Frigates, galleons, and so forth. Um, and with pictures of each of them. That is just really nice. There is This whole thing is full of illustrations, and that's going to give players something really concrete to hang on to. When you tell them, do you want to get a galleon or a ship of the line, what is the difference between that? Well, they can actually see it, which is going to be very helpful. Uh, ships at sea, the names of random ships, great, because you're going to have random encounters with those. Uh, different cargo that they're holding could be special cargo, like sea monster bones or exotic animals, and plot twists, like they're all zombies or the crew are imposters. Uh, stopping a pirate can be dangerous to your health. So ran into a random uh, pirate. Who is it? Let's roll them up. Table A, perhaps it is a cloaked figure with horrible breath wielding a blunderbuss. Pretty straightforward. Uh, there's also uh, lots of different uh, names here that you can grab uh, with surnames and nicknames. I think it says you can roll two times, maybe combine them in one way or another, like the Gunpowder King or the White Death. Uh, jobs and quests that you can roll up. So this would work really well for any sort of open world or um, West Marches type of game where you're going to have players um, just taking their own initiative and traveling around and trying to solve quests rather than you know a particular plot line, which is something I really like. Derelict Shipped Generator. This reminds me a little bit of stuff we've seen from the Mothership sci-fi role-playing games. Uh, where is this ship? It's dried up in riverbed. It's a type of ship. It's a galleon. What happened there? Ripped in two by a monster from the deep. Uh, what's an odd feature of it? Ornately decorated in gold leaf and velvet. Uh, development. Extreme weather, perhaps while you're looting the ship. Current occupants, original cargo. Great stuff. This is especially uh, true if you're going to be um, looting ships, right? Because you can sail near a reef, find the corpse of a ship, and go in there and find all sorts of horrible surprises, but also possibly great treasure as well. I really love the design of this alchemy page. Uh, you can create some uh, potions by combining ingredients, get random colors as well, and all sorts of different effects. Um, you can either just roll 1d20 and read straight across. You can uh, roll on all three of those tables. You can pick them. Lots of different options for people to make their own stuff. Uh, there is an adventure at the back of this book, The Curse of Skeleton Point. Um, and the basic idea is, well, there's lots of different things going on in this adventure, which I like because it is very open. It's not uh, plot driven at all. It's mostly driven by different characters and what they want. It has a lineup of the characters here. Again, it reminds me of what we've seen in Mothership, like in some of their adventures have this. And my adventure, The Waking Willoughby Hall, does a similar format where you just have other portraits at the top and then write-ups going down. It's really effective. Um, and it focuses very much on what they seem to want, what they really want, what are they up to right now. So the whole thing is going to be driven by the NPCs. You have Black Coral Bay here. Uh, there's a sort of a haunted castle there. There's a town. There's a lighthouse. There, uh, the mayor of the town is secretly a necromancer. Um, his daughter has run away and it turns out, you can find out this later, that she is in love with a skeleton at the castle. There's all sorts of complications that can come in as the different players play out their desires. 
I also really like, if I go back here, there is a timeline that tells you what will happen if the players do nothing. I've been seeing this more and more in old school adventures and it's really helpful because um, if the players just are hanging around in town and doing their own thing for a while, that's fine. You can figure out uh, how things are progressing up to that point. And so they can figure out that if they don't interfere with the line of, uh, or the, the fate of what's gonna happen in this adventure, then things are gonna get worse and worse and worse. It's a little bit of a motivation for them to interfere, which is always great. Uh, I've got some random counters for daytime and nighttime. I love this picture of Coral Town. This actually reminds me of some of those backdrops from the uh, Monkey Island games, where you can just see the whole town laid out before you in you know, fully illustrated and isometric format, and players can imagine walking around and going from place to place. All of the main buildings have write-ups. Uh, there are random ships that are there. There are rumors that you can pick up. And we have a actual map of the haunted castle that you can explore as well. Um, it's very complex. There's lots of loops. There's secret passages. There's ways that you can get around. And because it's a castle, you can either go up on the inside or I can imagine you could climb up the exterior of it and explore that way. Um, the design of the adventure themselves is very well done. It reminds me of the adventures back in Merkberg. So you have... Um, if there's a actual deadly encounter or a dangerous encounter, then it's done in red with a little skull and crossbones. So it visually tells you what that is. If there is a room where you can leave or go off in a different direction, there actually is an arrow there telling you which direction you're going in, especially if you're going up or down, since this is a vertical map. And that just saves you even more time. They just take the normal bullet point and they make it an arrow. Simple little tricks like that just make things easier. Characters are automatically underlined. Um, anything that's important that you should know is in bold. It's just really great, really quick to read. As you can see over here, it's not fully finished yet. Some of these rooms do not have full descriptions, um, but they will by the, the time that this uh, the book is finished, obviously. We have a summary at the back of the book for naval combat abilities and tests that you can easily use. And we have a character sheet, quite vibrant and easy to read. If I turn my head sideways. And we have our back here. So still to come, there's they're going to create a treasure map generator, which is really fun. Reminds me a little bit of um, Sea of Thieves in that sense. Uh, archetype sea captains, uh, sea shanties, spells that crews can sing while traveling or during naval combat. That's really clever. Uh, people love sea shanties. And every pirate game has them. And it's great that it has made a mechanical thing. Maybe if all the players sing it, then you get bonuses. That would be even cooler. A uh, bunch of new locations, lots more monsters, stretch goals from Pele Nilsson, who was the creator of the original game, and Jacob Hurst from the Dark of Hot Springs Island, and Christian Eichhorn. I'm not familiar with him, but he's another um, creator from this particular scene. So that's it for Pirate Borg. If you are into Merkberg, this is, seems like a really great supplement. It is very dense. It's very fleshed out. There's tons of stuff for you to use. And even if you don't use the system, if you wanna do anything pirate related, there is so much stuff here for you to steal. If this looks appealing to you, if this is your kind of game, go down to the description below. As usual, I will put links to where you can pick this up on Kickstarter. It should be live when this video goes live. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.